Let's talk a bunch of different topics. How her career get there. This is a podcast with Lauren Asgari. This is the Lauren Asgari podcast, How'd Her Career Get There? And my guest today is Janice Millam, who has had a uh, extensive career uh, rolling up to an executive role at Marriott and then recently joining uh, with her husband to start a, a business, which we will get to later. But for starters, Janice, welcome. Thank you for having me, Lauren. I am so excited uh, to do this. We had gotten introduced um, through a, a mutual acquaintance who spoke very highly of you. Um, and even just talking with you for like the two minutes that we did before we started recording, there's just, I love your energy and there's something about you that I'm, I'm um, drawn to. So I'm really excited to, to continue the conversation. So uh, let's get right to it. Let's start, um, uh, let's start backwards and then we'll, we'll fast forward to present day. Give a little bit of, um, of context of where you grew up, what you were like as a kid, kind of your, uh, your origin story. Okay. <laughs> well, I grew up in Kansas. I grew up in a small town in South Central Kansas called Hutchinson, Kansas. Um, and so as a kid, I, I'm the oldest of, of three children. Um, my, my father was an um, entrepreneur and a, um, he was in the grain storage and handling business. Um, and he was a, an engineer and a salesman, and my mother worked for a motivational speaker. So I grew up listening to um, Zig Ziglar and um, uh, you know all the motivational speakers in the bathroom as we're getting ready in the morning, and then also knowing a lot about my father's business and, and uh, being a salesman. And I would say as a kid, I was described as bossy. Now, I like to think of that as actual the first sign of leadership, but I was I, admittedly a little bossy. And where did you fall uh, with your siblings? Like oldest? I'm the oldest. Yeah, the I'm oldest. the oldest of three. Yeah. My brother is um, about 18 months younger than I am. And my sister is nine years younger. So, um, and grew up, I mean, it was great. The, the town I grew up in was, we had one major high school and it was a great um, upbringing. My parents um, were, you know, were amazing parents. My dad did some traveling but they were always there for us. In fact, they started the business in the house, so they were literally there. And so it really was a, it was a great childhood. Unfortunately, my father passed away um, when he was 57 and I was in my early 20s. So that was, um, you know, that was a tough life um, time, but, um, but it, it certainly was a, a, a wonderful childhood, I'll, I'll, that for sure. What do you remember from your parents, either together as individuals, but, but a life lesson that you learned from them that you've really carried with you and has impacted you on who you are today? Great question. You know, my parents told us we could do anything we put our minds to, and they always encouraged us to, to go for it, whatever it was. And, um, you know, they, my, they were very hardworking. Um, they, you know, I'm a first generation college student. They never went to college and they were very, very encouraged us to get our education um, and to, to do our best. They didn't um, put too much pressure on us though. I mean, they, 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 they wanted us to, to want it. They wanted us to want it for, for, for ourselves, not because they wanted us to, to be successful. So, um, and I would say, you know, I learned from my father. He started, was traveling internationally um, at, at later in his career, and he just loved people, and he, he valued relationships above everything, and I think that's something that I, I, I've taken with me into business. And when you were a little girl, what do you remember, if you did, and I'm, I'm air quoting grow up as if any of us always ever, you know, officially <laughs> reach some age where we're grown up, but what, um, what did you aspire to be um, as you got older, I'll say, in, career, in a career? Yeah, I didn't, I really didn't have a real vision. You know, I went, when I went to college, I, I um, got my degree in journalism and public relations, and I thought I wanted to be in that, that field, but I... Um, I knew that I wanted to be a business person. I knew I wanted to be a business person and I knew I wanted to be a leader. I think I um, knew I would be good at sales. You know, even as growing up, I was in Girl Scouts and my goal was always to sell them as Girl Scout cookies, right? Um, and so I knew I was ambitious and I knew that I wanted to be in business, but I didn't have a whole lot more uh, than that, that I, that I really had a vision for. And so I sort of just... Um, trusted the process. I tell people a lot, sometimes people are so concerned about that first job that they get out of college, and it's like the most important decision they're ever going to make in their life. 
And I don't think that's true. I think unless you're really clear on what you want to do at an early age, it's just kind of get in there and figure it out. And so you went to, where did you go to school? Where did you go to college? I went to the University of Kansas. Okay, where that is, uh, uh, oh my gosh, how do I not know that mask? Is that a Jayhawk? Is it is. Jayhawk. I'm so impressed. It is yeah. a Jayhawk. I'm a and basketball these, fan. Yeah, we have all these mythical birds in Kansas as mascots. <laughs> I've never quite understood that. But yes, I'm a Jayhawk and uh, proud, proud of it. Um, get back occasionally to do some uh, alumni work there. So um, yeah, really great place to go to school. So you went to college and then you graduated and you decided I'm going to go do what? So I knew um, I was interviewing on campus and I was interviewing with a lot of different companies. I was interviewing with Coca-Cola. I was interviewing with um, IBM, um, but I actually went to work for Procter & Gamble right out of college. And um, I took a sales position in Kansas City, which is about 45 minutes away from where I went to college. And um, I was selling, I had the glamorous job of selling paper products. So I sold Charmin toilet paper. I sold um, Puffs um, facial tissues. I sold um, Pampers and Loves. And um, my job was to go into grocery stores and make sure we had as much um, presence on the shelf as possible with those products. So here I am in my little suit and tie you know, little back then we wore bow ties and I'm going in to you know try to convince these um, grocery store managers which were very different than me <laughs> that I to take me seriously right as a, as a the, right off the turnip truck salesperson um, and uh, yeah that was my first that was my first job out of college I did that for about 18 months what when you were doing that do you remember this is I, I know going back to earlier in your career but do you remember thinking like what did you like about that job and what did you not and what then did spring uh springboarded you to what you did next yeah so what i got really clear on so so i felt like i had hit the lottery because not only did i i uh, was making a what i thought was a great salary at the time but i also had a company car but i worked from home and so it was very isolating for me so while i was good at sales and i was good at developing the relationships i really missed people and I got into, this is sort of a dirty little secret, but I got into this terrible habit where I figured out I could go out really early in the morning, do all my rounds, be done by about 11, and I could actually do all my paperwork in front of my favorite soap operas. <laughs> and, and it was like not good. This was not a good environment, right? And so um, I realized early on that working from home full time was not going to work for me. It was not going to be my preferred. So I started getting calls from headhunters and some of that. It, Dr. Gamble's sales training is amazing. And I started getting some, um, some calls and started looking at some other opportunities and really just sort of fell into the hospitality business. It was not on my radar screen. I loved hotels growing up. I can remember vividly um, going with my parents to um, grain storage and handling conventions mm -hmm. and staying at hotels and thinking that was so cool. But it really just, I, I sort of just fell into it as I started looking for something else. And then did you go right from P&G to Marriott? So actually not Marriott because I went to this little hotel company called the Residence Inn. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Marriott did not own the brand. So I actually um, went to work and I'll remember, I'll never forget the Procter & Gamble. My boss at Procter & Gamble did a full court press. Um, they called me into their office. They said, this is all the reasons why you should not go to work for this company. You know, it's a small company. It's a startup. They don't know what they're doing. It's never going to go anywhere, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, married it and ended up buying residence in about five years later after I, I joined. But yeah, at the time I opened, I believe the 13th residence in um, that, 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 that ever was. And um, that was early on for the brand and now there are over 800 residents and hotels um, globally. So uh, that's where I got my start. And it wasn't until Marriott bought the brand that I actually came to work for Marriott. So it would have been about five years later that I actually came to work for Marriott. So I worked for a franchisee at the time who was growing um, residence inns and um, I, I opened one of their hotels and then I joined their management company. So your job in that capacity was to do you scout out a location? The franchisee has says, hey, we're going to open at this location and your job's to go make sure that everything looks right. Like, we'll talk through, I'm interested in that. Talk through a little bit about yeah, what yeah. your job so, is. So when I joined the franchisee, I was head of their sales and marketing. So what we did is um, when we got a, um, uh, another hotel that we were building, we started um, all the pre-marketing to understand who all the um, corporations were around. And we would hire all the salespeople, train the salespeople. And my role was to make sure that they had all the tools to be able to fill the hotel. 
So um, we hired, we trained, um, we, you know, did our marketing and sales plans. And I think we opened, I want to say about five hotels in the, in the time that it was, it was rapid growth. I mean, five is not a lot, but one, one a year is yeah. quite a lot for a small company. So um, it was great. And, and I did do some feasibility work early on too. So if there was a location that we were interested in getting the franchise for, I would go in and, and figure out if there was enough demand in the area to support the actual um, hotel. And so I, I would help do some of that early on before we even got the project approved as well. So it was really good learning because it was a small company. We had to be scrappy. Um, and uh, it, it was, it was, I think it really helped prepare me then for moving into the role that I did at Marriott for sure. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bounce around a little bit with my questions because you, um, I can tell from talking to you, you're like super sharp and on it. So I feel like I can go at a quick pace and you'll like more than head. Um, so what, what do you say to, to people who feel like they, when they're just looking for a job out of school, what's your advice to them? What, have, what would you have told your younger self about feeling like you have to land something that is going to be it for the rest of your career? Because you said it earlier, and I think you're right, a lot of people focus on getting the perfect job instead of using it as an opportunity to discover what you don't want versus it having to be what you want. Yeah, you know, I do get, get an opportunity to um, mentor a lot of, of people and, and that are deciding to make a move either right out of college or a move in their career. And, and I do tell them that, you know, I, I think you have to just um, you have to know what, what you like and what you don't like as best as you can um, and try to sort of fit whatever job you, you choose with what, what, what you think is going to, you know, get you excited to get up in the morning and go to work. But if it doesn't, if it's not right for you, then that's what you'll learn. You'll learn in your first or second job. And I think we sometimes think we, we put so much pressure on our decision making around, um, you know, should I move sideways? Should I move, you know, and I think, I think I heard Brene Brown say this to her daughter. I, I didn't hear her, but she said this in a podcast. She said, if you if you go to college and think you already know what you want to do, I'm not going to pay for it. If you go to college and you stay open to what the possibilities are, then I'll pay for it. But if you already know you're going to go be a X, Y, Z, I'm not paying for it. Yeah. And I thought that was such a great way to set her daughter up for success to say, go out, learn, learn what you like, learn what you don't like. And I would say that this, that's true for the job market too, or, or as you navigate your career, it's like, just jump in there, do your best to try to you know, sort out what you think you, you like and also who you work for and the people that you work with is incredibly important. And you'll figure that out along the way as well. Let's spend a little bit. I love that you just quoted Brene Brown because I'm such a fan of hers. We actually, when we hire people here internally, part of our onboarding is having them watch a Brene Brown clear as kind video as setting up the foundation of how we awesome. like to communicate internally. So I love that you referenced her. Um, and you said another like nugget there that I want to, I want to, drill a little bit deeper on. Um, oh my gosh, just like that, it left me and it was so, uh, ah, what was it? I'm going to come back to it because I'm going to remember it because you said something okay. that I loved. Um, so let's, oh, no, I remembered it. How important is it, um, you said there, the people that you work for and the people that you work with really matter. Um, elaborate in your experience in terms of giving advice or guidance to people, whether they're in a new career or uh, just getting into um, a job out of school. How important is the person that you work for? How can that propel you or hurt you in your career? Great question. So I, I have heard it said that people leave bosses, they don't leave companies. And I think that's really true. I have worked for some of the best people and some of the best bosses ever. And I've worked some, with some really bad ones. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I probably, I, I learned from both. Um, but I, from probably my worst boss was before Marriott. Um, and I, you know, what I would, I would you know, sort of go behind him and clean up the dead bodies that he would leave in his wake. Um, and I, I learned a lot about what not to do. So while that was an experience that I'm grateful for, I'm more grateful for the, the bosses that, you know, were, were really mentors, sponsors, um, teachers. And um, I, I do think that's incredibly important. I, I do think that having a boss that is um, uh, that is has your best interests in mind. That wants to help you grow um, and learn is is incredibly important as you're thinking about the job you take. And so now now let's jump back to I, I appreciate you humoring me and bouncing around a little bit here. This is this is fun to play a little bit. Let's bounce back to um, 
you're, you're at uh, Residence Inn, they get acquired by Marriott, and then what happens to, to you? So then I um, decide to move to Atlanta, Georgia, and I become a regional director of sales and marketing, and I'm um, opening hotels again now for Marriott, and uh, um, uh, I have, I think, three or four states, like Florida, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and we're opening hotels, and we're hiring teams, and we are um, trying to make sure that the hotels are, are full, so um, it was uh, it was a great way for me to take what I'd done for the a small company and now uh, bring it into the context of, of this big company called Marriott. We set up the sales training for the brand, um, and uh, and that was a great job because I was traveling a lot. I was meeting a lot of people. Um, that was probably the first time the travel bug really hit me because mm -hmm. I was traveling, you know, in several different states and cities. So um, it was great. And then after that, I ended up moving to headquarters for a little uh, stint with, with uh, for my first stint at headquarters with residents in. So take, uh, take us through, because, um, I mean, you had a, a wildly impressive and extensive career there. Take us through uh, your time at Marriott, and then I'm going to shift to what you're doing now, and then a couple of, uh, of different topics. But, but take us through from a... Um, the types of jobs that you were doing there, um, and then what really impacted you about your time there? Yeah, so I was on a sales trajectory, certainly. My, my, um, that was my power alley, what I was known for, um, as, as I've ex explained. But when I got to headquarters, I was leading um, all the regional directors of sales and marketing and, and the marketing and sales for, for the brand. And what happened is we hit a, we hit a, a recession, or we hit a bump in the road, and um, some tough decisions had to be made where um, positions need to be eliminated. So pretty much my entire team was eliminated. And my, um, my boss's boss at the time took me to dinner, and he said, Janice, you're really talented. I think that you've got a great future with the company. There's a couple ways you could go. We could make you, um, uh, we could put you in human resources, uh, or you could go out into the field, and you could actually start to run our hotels. And uh, at the time, you know, that, that was uh, staying in DC and being in human resources would have been a higher level position, mm -hmm. but it was also pretty typical for a female to go into human, re human resources. So I made the decision based on his great advice to actually move to the field and move to the West Coast. And I started running a hotel, one hotel, um, one residence in hotel as a general manager. And then I was fast tracked. I knew I, I would not be doing that. I was just kind of learning the ropes. I was fast tracked then into a area GM where I had several hotels and GMs reporting to me. But I'm so grateful that I made that decision because it really rounded me out as a business person. And from there, I ended up um, going into full service. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I did a stint with Courtyard as an area GM. I went into full service. I was a hotel manager at a huge, um, hotel in San Francisco. It's now the um, uh, San Francisco Marquee. And then I, I had my own full service hotel in um, the East Bay. And then I had our, I had our daughter. Um, and that was, a, that was a, a quite an experience because we had a really hard time getting her here. And, um, and so that sort of shifted everything for me. And after she was born, we ended up, I took a step back actually and moved to Arizona as a general manager. Um, and sort of got off the radar for a while um, and raised our daughter and my husband started his business. And then after about 10 years, it was time and uh, I got the call to come to headquarters. And uh, then at that point, it was I was the vice president um, and global brand leader for Courtyard, which is Marriott's largest brand globally um, in terms of numbers of units. And then my most previous role that I just um, had for the last probably seven years was um, Senior Vice President and Global Brand Leader for Marriott's Classic Select Brand. So that's a mouthful. But what that is, is um, the seven brands were Courtyard, Fairfield, Residence Inn, Town Place Suite, Spring Hill Suite, Four Points, um, and then Protea, which is our brand in South Africa. And those are those brands represent about 40% of the revenues to Marriott International. So while they're not the sexy brands, they're the um, they're the money makers, mm -hmm. and so it was, the money uh, makers can be sexy. Well, that's true. <laughs> I used to say they're not the, the they're not the brands you want to uh, to date, but they're the ones you want to marry, right? So, <laughs> um, but uh, and and so exciting because I was we were growing these brands globally at a fast clip, and so got to to travel some amazing places. I got to travel the world, and and it was an experience that I would have never had had I not taken that role at headquarters. So while it was tough to move a 10-year-old um, and my husband across the United States, 
um, to, to take that, that role of courtyard. It, I think we all look back at it. It was a great decision for all of us as a family. You said um, so much there that I'd like to dive a little bit deeper, deeper into a couple things that you said, because I think it can be a, a challenge that, um, that women or, or men uh, might face um, in their careers. Or I don't want to say a challenge, a choice. So um, uh, talk a little bit about your, at whatever level you're comfortable, your decision to take time away from work to raise your daughter and yeah. then jumping back into it. Yeah, so, so just to clarify, I didn't really take time away from work. I was okay. actually out of work for six months because I ended up in the hospital um, for when I was pregnant with her for three months before she was born. And then I took another three months off after she was born. So I did take that six months off, but I was still technically employed with Marriott. But then when I came back to work um, and I was making that hour commute each way to work and juggling nannies and you know all of that, and, and I was on a bit of a, um, you know, I was president of this and running this chamber thing and everything. It just was, it was a lot. And it was, it was, um, uh, my husband and I made the decision that I would take a step back and take a smaller hotel. Mm -hmm. And we moved to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona at that point. And I went from running about a, a 350 room hotel to a 250 room hotel. And I was area general manager in, in um, uh, the, the, the Bay Area. And I just took a one hotel job in Scottsdale. And so a lot of people thought I was crazy. My boss at the time even said, Janice, this is not a good decision. This is really going to be harmful to your career. And I thought, well, you know what? I, I just know that this is right for me and my family right now because it really, I want to focus on, um, you know, simplifying. Mm -hmm. And I've said to several people, Lauren, over the years, you know, when you're good, people will continue to, to invite you to the dance. Mm -hmm. And you just have to be the best at what you're doing at the time. And you get to decide if, when you're ready to, go, to jump back into the dance. Mm -hmm. And I had lots of different opportunities over those 10 years that I was in Scottsdale. Um, I did end up, um, after a time, taking on more responsibility after about three years in. Um, my boss at the time was an area general manager, and he left. And I went to, to his boss at the time and I said, okay, you know, I moved here because I don't, I don't want to kind of get back into the rat race. But I said, I'm not sure I want that job that he just left, but I don't know that I want anybody else to have it. So let's talk about how we can make this work, right? And so I did end up taking the area general manager job. And by the time I left, I was running two hotels and I was an area general manager. So it's not as if I didn't continue to increase my responsibility, but I did it more on my terms. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to think I did it more with um, a little bit more work-life integration. Mm -hmm. it's always been a, that's always been a challenge for me, um, work-life integration, but it's, it's, uh, it's something that I've either been moving toward or away from my entire career. But um, I learned a lot through, through that period. So that's kind of a long story, but um, that's what happened. And then, and then when, when it was time and I got the call to come to headquarters, um, even though it was a big leap, I felt like it was, it, it was time. And I had my mm -hmm. husband's support. And uh, yeah, so it all worked out. I love every single thing that you just said there. I love the the work life integration versus you know work life balance. It's just funny. I, I use integration too when I describe it because balance to me just it, they all just exist, right? It's like it's part of who you are, right? You're uh, ambitious in your career. You're ambitious as a wife. You're ambitious as a mom, right? Like and and it's not like you're balancing them. It's just that's who you are and different pieces of the pie that make up who Janice is, right? So I, I love that you said that. Um, talk talk a little bit about um, your perspective of what makes a good uh, salesperson or good um, person in sales or marketing. I think. Um some of the best salespeople that I've worked with have the, the best relationships with their customers. They really get in and they develop the relationships and they really understand how they can help the customer. They're not trying to sell them something, right? Um, and I, I really think that's important. I think it's really important that you, um, that you recognize that you're there to help solve a problem and uh, how does your product help solve a problem and, and really work through that angle. Um, and then I think, you know, people like buying from people that they like. You know, and so that's why the relationships are so important. So I, I think that's, you know, as I look at my, my partner who's joining me in this next venture, she was my uh, head of sales and marketing when I was in, in Arizona. And she's one of the best salespeople I've ever worked with because she, she had all those traits that I just described. 
Love that. I love that. So um, let's go back to, um, cause I want to talk about getting to uh, your, your new venture and what you're doing now. So um, finish out for us, however you would like to, um, how you finished at Marriott and then transition to what you're doing now. Yeah. So um, 2020 as my final year at Marriott was quite the way to go out. Right. Um, I had always planned to retire at the end of 2020. And then when COVID hit, um, myself and my entire team went on furlough um, the 1st of April. So that was really um, difficult. I was on furlough for four months and my team was on furlough for six months. So my, my final sort of act at Marriott was to um, take a team of two teams of 50 people um, and let um, half of those folks know that they didn't have jobs, which was really tough. Um, but um, try to counsel them and, um, and support them as best I could um, through their, you know, what their next thing would be um, and, and put the team together uh, that was going to, to stay, including the leader that um, would be replacing me. Uh, and uh, that's really how I finished out my career. So while, while it was bittersweet in some ways, what I, what I like to say, Lauren, is that, and this is not said from a, an egotistic point of view, but I felt like better me than somebody else to help to deliver that tough message and to help the teams to come together and figure out how to, to, to um, navigate in the new norm because I'm the kind of leader that has always led from my heart um, and always led with compassion. And I think it, it really um, helped a lot in one of the more difficult times um, that I've had to, to lead, which was through this, this pandemic. So um, it was, it was a, um, a kind of sad to, to leave Marriott without some pomp and circumstance after a 30 year career, but, but it was um, also the teams, you know, um, you know, we did goodbye Zooms and, and all of that. So um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. So, um, and I feel like I left, I left as, as best as I could given the circumstance. So that made me feel good as, as sort of um, my last day was December 23rd of, of 2020. So, mm -hmm. and then you, and I, I can imagine from a leadership perspective, and you just said it there, the, the leading with compassion and the human first part versus um, not doing that to the people on the other side had to be ex extremely impactful given everything, right? That was I hope, going on. I hope so. And a lot of people said so. So um, that, that was where my, that was my goal. I love that. Um, so let's spring forward to, uh, to your new venture, um, Questage, uh, and let's talk a little bit about that. What is that? What got you going with, uh, with that? And let's unpack that a little bit. Okay. So my husband, um, actually it's, he started, he, when I was, um, when I was in the Bay area, I discovered this thing called, um, uh, coaches training Institute. My husband was at the time a career consultant and he, um, I, 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 went to a couple of sessions. And I said, this coaching thing is really fascinating. I think you would be really good at it. Um, so he ended up um, sort of jumping in and got his certification, his, his um, coaching certification. And he's a master certified coach. Um, I'm very proud of him. He's, he's one of very few that have that designation and he's really good at what he does, but he's been sort of a one man show um, in the leadership consulting and coaching um, arena. And so he's always had a dream that we would work together and I wasn't just sure about it. But um, as we started talking about what I wanted to do next, it's really clear that the, this leadership conversation is something I, I'm very passionate about. And especially when it, when it um, um, pertains to women, because I think as women, we have some unique challenges and opportunities as, as we navigate through corporate, our careers and, and leadership. And so um, I decided after thinking I was gonna stand up my own little consulting business, I'm like, why don't I just join you and we'll um, figure out how to, how one plus one is more than two. And so we're actually, um, we're rebranding Questage now because if you, uh, if you looked at it, it was very much about my husband, Alan, but uh, we've got another partner who's a former Marriott associate, actually the one I referenced who was my sales and marketing mm -hmm. leader. She's, she's now gotten her coaching certification too. Um, and so she's joining us and she and I will be um, working on standing up some women's uh, leadership programs, um, including some, mind, uh, some women's, reader, women's leadership roundtables, um, which we're just kicking off. And then we're, we're also looking to do a women's leadership mastermind, which we're really excited about. And then um, the other thing I've decided to do is I've uh, applied to Cornell and I'm gonna get my a degree or a, not a degree, a certificate in um, diversity and inclusion. 
because that's also something I'm incredibly passionate about beyond just the women's conversation. Mm -hmm. So we'll see where that, that goes. Um, so, uh, so that's what we're up to and more to follow. We're just starting to, to kind of lay the groundwork. I love that. I love those initiatives. And I can tell just even by the way that you're talking, how energetic and passionate you are about those subjects, which when, you know, talent intersects with passion, I feel like that's just a home run. So that's, I'm super excited to hear more from you on that, uh, as you continue to grow that. So, um, what would you, what advice, we touched on this a little bit earlier, I'm going to ask it just in general, general terms, more broadly. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? You know, I have a 21-year-old daughter. So um, that's, you know, I'm, I'm giving her younger self advice when she'll listen. Um, uh, you know, I, I, you posed that question in sort of prep, and I thought a lot about it. I think the thing I would say is do, do your personal work and do it, do it um, early and often. You know, I, I say to people, and I'm serious about this, I think everybody should have a coach or a therapist or sometimes both. Mm -hmm. Because I think that um, for me as a leader, um, if I had not lost my father when I did and, and gone to therapy and worked through that, and then, um, you know, other opportunities to hire a coach or, or a therapist, I, I would not be the leader I am today had I not done those things. And so um, I, I probably didn't start as earlier as I could or should have, but I'm, when I did jump in, I jumped in full force. So that, that would be one piece of advice. The other piece of advice would be, if you want to have a family, don't wait. I was so focused on my career and my ambition that I didn't start to try to have a family until I was into my mid thirties. Mm -hmm. And then it became very difficult. Um, and I'm very lucky to have the one child that I do but I do wish that I had more, um, but it, it was too late for me. So, um, you know, we're, we don't encourage young women to um, get pregnant and have babies early when they're young in their career. And I think we need to have the, the hard conversation with people that, you know, when you turn 30, it, it, you know, it, there's statistics that it's harder and harder to get pregnant. And nobody told me that. I, didn't, mm -hmm. wasn't, paying, I wasn't paying attention, right? Um, so that would be the other advice I would give to my younger self. If you know you want to have a family, start earlier and don't be concerned that that's going to um, mess up your career. I am, I'm literally, and not bad tears, I'm literally like starting to get teary eyed because what you're saying is resonating with me so much. I waited, and, and you and I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, you know, thank God or whatever it is that you believe in, right? Uh, we have two beautiful, healthy baby girls. Um, but I did postpone getting pregnant or trying to get pregnant because I was in a career that I felt I needed to, to not do that, right? That that would not have been, and not, not, in a, not even intentionally looked upon negatively, but at a place where, it, you know, it would have restricted my hours or, you know, I wanted to be in a sales role. And what does that mean to go out in front of like customers? And again, I'm going back like eight years when times, I hate to say like times were different then, but even as soon as eight years ago was a different reality than what I see today in terms of what's accepted and not accepted. And I actually ended up starting the, the, the kind of crux in starting my business. It's now seven years in was that my husband and I, we got pregnant with our first daughter and I was working you know, eight to six thirty, pretty regularly at my other job, and um, telecommuting then was just—it wasn't an option. I had a forty-five-minute commute on either side, and so then I'm making the choice of either I get to see—I don't get to see my daughter to pursue my career ambitions, or what do I do? I get a job closer to home where I can start my own business, and that was really the pushing point to start my own business. Was I didn't want to dial back my career ambitions but I still had, you know, ambitions in my personal life, right. To be a mom and, and other things. So um, what you said there just, it just really resonated with me. So I love that you shared that. Well, I, I, I thank you for sharing your story too, because I, I don't think we have as very many role models that, uh, that have shown us that you can um, have the children at an early age and, and still, you know, really grow your career. So I love what you've done too. I think that's just, that's, that's a, a wonderful way to approach it. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget being on a call with several senior women at Marriott. And I was the only one on the call that was married. I hadn't had my child yet, but I was the only one that was married. And it was like, oh my gosh, what is this saying? You mm -hmm. know? So um, I hope that you and I will be role models for other young women 
that you can um, have a really successful career and be ambitious and still have a family. And, and um, you know, it's not always perfect, but you, you can do it. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, what, how do you define success? Mm. Ooh, that's a good one. You know, I think at the end of the day for me, it's, it's making an impact in other people's lives. Uh, and, and I know that sounds lofty, but at the, at the end of the day, it's not the title. It's not the, how many people report to you. It's not even the, the responsibility. It's how do you help other people grow and achieve their fullest potential? And that's, I think, why I'm so drawn to the leadership conversation and the, and the women's work is because it's, you know, I mentored so many people throughout my career at Marriott. Um, and, and people would always say to me, gosh, you're so busy. I so appreciate your time. And I would say, you don't, you don't understand. At the end of the day, I get as much out of this as you do. So to me, that, that, that is how I would define success when you really can help other people grow and achieve their dreams. And, and when you talk about leadership, um, what are some traits in your mind that, that make up a good leader? Um, authenticity, number one. Um, this is controversial, and this is Brene, but the the ability to be vulnerable, mm-hmm. um, that is incredibly powerful, I believe. Um, I think somebody who's confident and um, brave and um, honest uh, and um, somebody who is compassionate. I talked a lot at, at work about leading from the heart and, and leading with love. Um, and my team would like be, oh God, she's bringing love into the workplace again. I'm like, well, guys can't help, but I mean, kind of who I am, you know? Um, but, you know, as, as you leave, people talk a lot about what, you know, what you meant to them and so forth. And that came through loud and clear is, you know, we've sometimes felt uncomfortable, but you taught us that it's okay to be vulnerable. So I think those are some of the key traits. And, and that's not just women either. You know, I, I know I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm, I'm going to because I think he absolutely made the, the best demonstration of vulnerability when we went into COVID. And that was um, Arnie Sorensen, our CEO at Marriott. And he gave a speech that where he broke down and, and got a little emotional. And I will tell you, it was the most amazing demonstration of vulnerability that I have seen in a leader. And I, you know, Arnie was an amazing leader. Um, but, uh, you know, I think for both men and women, the ability to lean into vulnerability is, is really powerful as a leader. And for the context of this, since, since you mentioned it, I, I, just to give some timing to it, Arnie passed away yesterday to, pancre- to his battle with pancreatic cancer. So Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I've heard nothing but wonderful things about him and his leadership style. So I'm glad to hear you're taking the opportunity to echo that. I know he was yeah. very near and dear to you. He was. Um, how much does listening to, I'm going back to something you said earlier, tied to Zig Ziglar. How much do you think listening to him or other motivational things just in the background when you were a kid, how much do you think that matters to the person that you are today? A lot, a lot. Not only did did that happen, but my father took me to a workshop that was called a Berkman workshop when I was, I think, 13. And it was a personality test where you had to learn the things that um, that were kind of your good personality traits and those things that weren't so great. And to look in the mirror at that age, I might have been 14 and have to look at the stuff that wasn't so great along with the stuff, of course, we focus on what's not so great, right? <laughs> was really was really hard. But I think it's why I was so drawn to my husband too and the work that he's doing. Um, right now, the, the big um, tool that, that everybody's um, looking at is the Enneagram and he's mm-hmm. certified in one of the most robust tools of Enneagram that's out there. And it's just, I think it's, it's, it was very foundational for me. And I believe that's the work that we all have the opportunity to do is to really get to know better who we are and what are, what are our bright sides, what are our dark sides and how do we continue to work on those? It's interesting. The Enneagram has come up. Um, I did a podcast interview maybe a week ago and she was talking about that. And uh, yesterday I was talking with somebody else and it came up. So it's, I got to look into it more. I'm I'm somewhat educated on it, but not nearly as uh, in depth as I should be because I feel like three times in a week is some sort of a sign telling me to investigate it a little bit more. So Well, well, we can hook you up with that with Questage because um, Alan is uh, certified with the integrative Enneagram and I'd be happy to um, have you go through that. And I'm sure he'd be happy to do 
do a, 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 you know, a debrief for you. I would love that. I would love that. I'll follow up with you offline for sure. Great. Um, what else I, I want to get to, um, actually, let me, let me ask this one last question before I get to, to rapid fire. Um, we talked about advice that you would give yourself as a, as a, um, what you would give your younger self. Can you share a story, just going back to the, the vulnerability piece, of a time at any point in your career when you did something that you, as soon as you did it, you were just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I did that. Like a, a misstep or something that you might have done differently. You know, I'm not sure if it's a misstep, but what came to mind when you, when you started asking that question was you might notice, do you see this thing on my wall back here that's a pink file? You probably can't tell what it is, but it's a in file, a black. Yeah. yeah, it's a pink file. So I'll just quickly tell you my signature pink file story because it kind of speaks to um, vulnerability and um, sort of a misperception. So um, early in my career, my boss, um, was, we didn't have, a, technology wasn't as prevalent. And my boss had a different color folder for every one of his direct reports. And so for Marshall Brown, he had a brown file. For Dale Athey, who had white hair, he had a white file. For Mike Gi Giamondo, who was from Col Colorado and very sort of earthy, he had a green file. For the one other woman that was on our team, who was um, Italian and really very fiery personality and um, uh, bigger than life, you want to guess what color her file was? <laughs> I'm gonna go red. <laughs> red. It was red, and mine was pink. And I had a real problem with the fact that mine was pink, um, because I made up that that meant that I was too girly, I was weak, you know, all these other things. And so I finally got up the courage to confront my boss about the color of the file. And in doing so, he was so taken aback that I had any that 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 was a problem for me because he said, "You're one of my best regionals." People love working for you. You get great results, but you do it in a very authentic, feminine, Janice kind of a way. And to me, that's pink. And I took a step back after getting over myself and thought, oh my gosh, he's right. And at that point, I embraced the pink file. And I leaned into the fact that, yeah, I was, I was, I was feminine and I was still ambitious and I still was a great leader, but I did it in a non-abrasive sort of not have to be like one of the guys kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so I just tell that story because, you know, as I've told that story throughout my career, that that ability to be vulnerable and to, you know, have a hard conversation and kind of have, turn your thinking around about something that you, I was all ready to fight for, you know, I can't believe you're calling me pink, right? Right. Um, when really it was very well-intentioned and he was right on. I love that story. Love that. Um, I'm going to get to uh, rapid fire questions, which are unrelated to anything that we've talked about. But before I do that, is there anything else that you want to touch on or that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about? No, I think um, this has been a very fun and very, I love the way you've meandered in the conversation. It's been fun. Yeah, I've, I've so much enjoyed this. I've so much enjoyed this conversation with you. Um, all right, so let's go to rapid fire. Again, unrelated to anything that we talk about, just first thing that comes to mind. Uh, there's like six questions here. So um, stone or brick? Stone. Netflix or cable? Netflix. Netflix or Hulu? Netflix. And are you binging any shows? Um, not, well, no. I just got done with Schitt's Creek recently. Um, got done with Ted Lasso recently. I really want to see The Queen's Gambit. That's mm. my next binge. That's a good one. That's a thumbs up. I recommend Queen's Gambit and I love Schitt's Creek. I think I like watched it twice over. Cracked me so up. So funny. So, so funny. funny. Love Moira. Yes. Love yes, me too. And I remember like, I've always thought she was funny. Like the actress. Um, oh my God, her name's escaping me. Catherine. Uh, her name just gave me, but she was yeah. in, you know, Home Alone, and, and yeah. I always thought she was funny, but in Schitt's Creek, it just, like, she, she cracked me up. She was one of my favorite characters. So great. Yeah. So great. So good. Um, astronaut or deep sea diver? Deep sea diver. Winter or summer? Summer. I live in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> mountains or beach? Mountains. Canyons or mountains? Mountains. And last one, sky or grass? Sky. All right. 
Well, Janice, thank you again so much for joining. I, I do. I feel like we're like kindred spirits. You said so much that resonated with me and I know it's going to resonate with our audience. And I just, I really enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed you sharing your story. And um, it's just such a pleasure talking with you and learning about your leadership style and your background and uh, all that you've accomplished and the people that you have impacted by just being, you know, you said it authentically you, I think that's mm -hmm. just so impactful. So yeah. You are sweet, and I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I, uh, I see an Enneagram debrief in our future. Sounds good. Sounds good. This is the Lauren Asgari podcast, How'd Her Career Get There? And we will see you next time.